Hello, welcome back to War Mysteries. I'm joined once again by Matt. Hello. As always, and I'm Jay. This week we're looking into a mysterious disappearance. During the closing years of the 1960s, the Cold War was at its height. <clears throat> Mutual distrust between the East and the West uh, had peaked. The world watched on as the, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis edged the two superpowers of the United States and Soviet Russia dangerously close to nuclear war. Amplified by the death of Kennedy, and the ongoing Vietnam conflict, uh, of course the tensions of the arms race. Away from this political minefield, a new type of Soviet submarine disappeared beneath the waves of the Pacific Ocean, which prompted a frantic search and rescue operation by the Soviet Navy. A search that would ultimately be completely fruitless. What's it with you? Nothing. For the Americans, however, this presented a unique opportunity, the potential recovery of a Soviet military submarine relatively intact with all of its secrets and without the knowledge of their adversary. That might have been the end of it. However, classified footage uh, and conflicting reports on the salvage operation have drawn forth many conspiracy theories over the last few years. But most critically, evidence seems to support the possibility of a nightmare scenario that the submarine equipped with nuclear ballistic missiles may have gone rogue. This is the insurrection of K-129. So this week is about a submarine. Submarine. Done one of them, really. We, well, mm. so K-129 was a Soviet Golf II class uh, ballistic missile submarine. We put it up there, haven't we? Yep, we put it up there for our viewers. That's the uh, general layout of the boat. You drawn it? I've, ne I've never drawn them. Okay. Let's, just, let's just assume I've never drawn them. Just... So that's the submarine, is it? That's the submarine. Disappeared in March of 1968. Lost. Uh, lost on radar, no radio contact. It says 8th of March on there. 8th of March, yeah. There we go. So it was lost in the Pacific Ocean. We'll put a picture of this there for our viewers. Just here, right on the very edge of the map, obviously. But it was lost um, off the coast of the uh, Kamchatka. Is that why they lost it? Because it got so close to the edge of the map. Would it it'd come back on the other side, wouldn't it? Yeah, it probably, yeah. Hmm. <clears throat> They found it. It was eventually recovered by the Americans in part, or well, that's part of the mystery, quite frankly. So the best, the best thing to do then really is to jump straight into it and have a look at the background of the situation. On February 28th, 1968, the K-129 left port for a Pacific patrol. It was a Golf II class diesel electric powered ballistic missile submarine, hull number 722, which was constructed in 1959 and was commanded by Captain Kobzar. It carried a standard complement of 83 crew normally, but on this occasion there were 98 men on board, and 40 of these were newly rotated onto the submarine for this patrol. So this submarine had more men on it than it should have had when it went down. Yeah, that wasn't found out until later on, uh, in the 80s. Boris Yeltsin, uh, who was the Russian premier at the time, mentioned it. Of those 98, 40 of them were new to the submarine for that trip. Probably didn't so, know the toilets were initially, teething problems. <clears throat> Not sure that's why it's on there. Unlikely, although if Harrison was on board it might have been why. Does he watch? Probably. We can't do a shout out for him. We'll yeah, yeah we can. No. He used to block toilets, so I'm sure he could do that on a sub. He used to call his shit to U boats. Just kept coming back up. Okay. Um, but yeah, there was, so there were, it was established later on that there were 98 people on board, um, which is more than there should have been. And they've never identified who those extra 15 people were. Can't ask him. He's dead. Yeah. In the submarine. They are dead. <clears throat> Under the water. <clears throat> oh, that's depressing. The patrol route took her out across the Pacific Ocean, past the 180th Meridian, and towards the United States. Combat patrols of this type commonly took these submarines within missile range of potential targets, so as to act as a deterrent force. 
and were employed by US, Soviet and even Chinese Navy vessels. The K-129 reached deep water shortly after leaving port, conducted a test dive to check systems, and then surfaced. After sending a radio message indicating that all was well, the submarine began her journey to the patrol area. The submarine was expected to communicate position data and vessel status at prearranged checkpoints, but these reports were not received by the Rebachi Naval Station. And which is near Vladivostok, I think. All right. So they, they so basically they went on their patrol, didn't report in. And so is Sean Connery been on board since he left Russia? Has Sean Connery been on board all that time, or does he get on board? What bit? Where? Are we, when do we get to the film? This is not that though. Yeah. Oh. Add to that the fact that Sean Connery wasn't actually on it. Why am I having to explain this? So you're telling me that Sean Connery will not come up at all in this? No, Sean Connery, un unless you specifically mention him, he will not come up in this. Neither so, Liam Neeson, right. not the Red October. It's the last, okay, all right. Nothing like that. All right, all right. It's not as exciting as I thought it was going to be then, because I thought, I genuinely thought that Sean Connery it's not was going to make This isn't Crimson Tide. Okay, all right, let's go through it. No, I don't want to do it now. By mid-March, Navy commanders at Kamchatka, the command station for the region, became concerned that no communications were forthcoming from K-129. The submarine was contacted on normal fleet broadcast channels to break radio silence and contact HQ. When this message was not answered, more urgent communications were sent, to which no replies were received. So at this point, mid-March this is now, um, it's not been in contact at any of the points it was supposed to be and they've got no idea where it is, because it hasn't told them. So essentially at this point, the submarine is missing. Yeah, it might be Liam Neeson that I'm thinking of. That's K-19. Liam Again, nothing, Neeson. Absolutely nothing to do with the story. <laughs> but that's who I'm thinking of, not Sean. Liam. Liam. Right, so we've gone from... Um, Hunt for Red October to K-19, the Widowmaker now, have we? <laughs> Nothing to do with the story. So, at all. Not coming up, Liam Neeson. The only similarity is that a Russian submarine was involved. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Nothing more. There can't be many more famous than one that Liam Neeson's been on. Apart from perhaps one that Sean Connery's been on. Aircraft and ocean vessels were quickly dispatched in large numbers to search for the submarine. But without recent navigational data, they had little choice but to follow the assigned patrol route. K-129 had disappeared, and the Soviet Navy had no idea where. So they started way up near Vladivostok and across... Well, it just followed it straight off. Where it would, where have, it would have gone. Where it was supposed to have gone. Yeah. Fair enough. It's a good idea. What the, pro do. the problem that they had was that <clears throat> where, where it sank was nowhere near its patrol route. But we'll get to that later on. At this point, it's gone. Bad news as well. For Pretty bad news because it's carrying nuclear weapons, uh, three of them at least, uh, and potentially nuclear tipped torpedoes as well, depending on which source you read. And now we move on to Project Azorian. What? Did I read that right? Where did you, how did you read that? The sudden influx of naval activity in the Western Pacific did not go unnoticed, however. The US military had a number of observation and acoustic listening posts monitoring the Pacific seaboard, which detected large-scale deployment of ships and submersibles. Thankfully, this mass of vessels was not taken for an invasion force but instead was correctly reasoned to be much more consistent with a coordinated search and rescue effort. It was even recognised as a search pattern used for tracking lost submarines. A similar procedural approach was in fact employed by the US Navy for locating critical nuclear assets in the event of a loss at sea. Thankfully this mass of vessels was not taken for an invasion force, which would probably have been quite a concern. The height of the 1960s Everything's going on. The Americans are just about to land on the moon. The arms race is still going on. 
there's a lot that's happened in this decade. Kennedy's dead. Yeah. Cuban Missile Crisis has happened. Castro's in power. You know, civil rights movements in the US. The tensions are pretty high. Um, Khrushchev was ousted in the 60s. So there's a lot going on. Owing to this information, the United States Sound Surveillance System naval facilities in the North Pacific were alerted by US intelligence services and asked to review acoustic records for early March 1968. An anomalous signal was found, which was recorded on March 8th by multiple different arrays and was reported as an isolated single sound of an explosion or implosion and a good sized bang. This anomaly was triangulated using the data from multiple sites and a five square mile search area at 40 degrees north on the 180th meridian was found to be the origin of the sound. The US did not share this information with the Soviet Union however and the K-129 was subsequently declared lost with all hands. So they go back through these records and they see that there is a big spike Almost like the Victor scale style sort needle, of, yeah, needle thing. Yeah. Little, they do that. There were two. Well, there were two sounds. Uh, one of them was heard to be an implosion, which is kind of like a. Sort of no, noise. No, it's more like a. All right. That yeah, that kind of noise. Vote in the comments. Which one was better? This is the bit that impressed me when I read about it. They triangulated it to a five square mile stretch of ocean. That is quite impressive. Which is pretty good, given that the Russians had absolutely mm. zero idea where to look. They were out of luck now, weren't they? Because they hadn't rung them when they got to that line. Yeah, they hadn't phoned them up and said, no clue. we're here. Maybe that's because, Lee no. We're not dead. Wasn't. Liam Neeson's not on board. K129 was subsequently declared lost with all hands, publicly. The Russians did that. They yeah. said, we've lost it. All this, dead. this boat's disappeared. Can't all find right. it. Uh, all of them gone, even Liam. Even, even Liam. The United States did not share this information with the Soviet Union. I mean, why would they? You know, it could have been, could have been anything really. They might have been conducting underwater tests. They don't know what it is yet. They don't know a sub sink. They just know that there was a pretty loud bang underwater. So they went to have a look. The US Navy dispatched a specially equipped photographic submarine, the USS Halibut, in July of 1968 to search the area under Operation Sand Dollar. And by August the 20th, the wreck had been located at a depth of 4,900 metres on the ocean floor. Over the following three weeks, the site was photographed and surveyed by the Halibut, which allegedly took over 20,000 photographs of the K-129 wreckage. Nearly two years later, on the advice of Henry Kissinger, who was then National Security Advisor, President Nixon authorised a recovery operation. It was hoped that they could salvage missiles from the wreckage, which would allow them to study Soviet nuclear weapon technology and also cryptographic material, which might in turn assist with SIGINT decryption efforts. By August 20th, the wreck had been located 4,900 metres down on the ocean floor, 16,000 feet or about three and a half miles. Three and a half miles? Down? <laughs> yeah, on the seabed, yeah. Well, no one's getting their missiles back then. <laughs> well, it's a long way it's down. It's ridiculous, three and a half miles. What are they doing, sailing over something that deep? On November 1st, 1972, construction began on a massive custom-built recovery ship, the 57,000-ton Glomar Explorer which was built by using a shell company as a front, owned by billionaire Howard Hughes, in order to maintain a cover story for the boat. If the Soviets got wind of the recovery operation, it could have provoked an international incident. Because the K-129 had sunk to such a great depth, the salvage operation would be well beyond any that had ever been attempted. However, the recovery would also be complicated by the fact that Soviet naval patrols would at some point discover the Glomar Explorer vessel. This meant that any salvage recovered would need to be hidden from outside view. To this end, 
a moon pool was built into the design of the Glomar Explorer, allowing any wreckage to be brought up inside the ship's hull. The K-129 would be brought up with a huge mechanical claw, constructed by Lockheed, known as the Capture Vehicle. Um, because obviously at the time, uh, they're really kind of at loggerheads, and any advantage that one can get over the other, any effort they can put through to, to get extra information out of the Soviets, without any, either without them knowing about it or otherwise, um, they were willing to do. So, Did they use this to get the ship up then? The submarine? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's why they built the ship with an internal Yeah, bag. with the... Yeah, inside, so, cool. they, so you can't see anything they bring up. Yeah. It's called a, a moon pool. So it's a, it was about 200 feet long, about 75 feet wide, and it basically occupied a third of the ship. 200 um, feet long, 75 foot wide. Nice, like a proper pool. Massive. Nice to light that up. Like I say, light that up. It's quite telling, because obviously they built it to a certain size. They must have known that they weren't going to recover the submarine hull because the K129 was 330 feet long, I think. We'll have to take it in bits. I think that was the idea. But the doors can close underneath so that once they've got... The whole thing can be done in the water, basically, without anyone outside seeing it. It's clever. It's clever. The Glomar Explorer set off from Long Beach, California on June 20th, 1974, and sailed 3,008 nautical miles. By July 4th, the ship had reached the recovery site and began salvage operations which took just over a month. The claw was lowered and raised using pipe string, similar to that used on oil rig drilling platforms. Section by section, pairs of 9.1 meter steel piping were strung together and lowered through a purpose-built orifice in the ship. Capture of the K-129's forward hull was allegedly successful, and the process was reversed. According to the official account, approximately 43 metres of the forward section, including the sail and centre section of the submarine, were raised initially, but at some point the capture vehicle suffered a catastrophic structural failure. The result of this was nearly 30 metres of the submarine, including the all-important sail, shearing off and sinking back down to the ocean floor. Critically, this lost section had included most of the important areas of the vessel, including ballistic missile storage and the code room. There better have been something good on it, what it got. <laughs> For all that effort. Wow, dearie yeah. me. A lot, lot of work. So it's got to come three and a half miles, and to, to get it up, they've got to raise the pipe work, take the pipes off, raise it up, take the pipes off. So however long it took to put this thing down there, it's going to take that long again to get it back up. Probably longer. But at some point before they got it up into the boat, there was a catastrophic failure of the claw, um, which either it either broke or damaged in some way, and the centre half of the ship just snapped off and fell back down to the ocean floor. Uh, so I'll put, I'll put a square around it there. They got that bit in the end. They actually got back that first. And then the other bit fell off. And then it snapped. That's a shame. Would have had the missiles. Yep, that's what they were after. An 11 metre section was said to be recovered successfully, which housed two nuclear torpedoes. Project Azorian was one of the most complex, expensive and secretive intelligence operations of the Cold War, and cost nearly $800 million at the time. Which is roughly $4 billion today for 11 metres of a submarine. Arguably the most useless part of it. Where is it now? What? That bit of submarine. No one knows. Somebody must know. Someone probably does, but it's not public information. Do you know? Do you know where it is? I probably don't. So they spent $800 million back then to build this ship undercover, send it out, took a month to lower this claw down, um, apparently it was made out of marriaging steel, which is which is really, really strong material, but it's not very ductile, so it's not got much capacity for sort of shearing forces and that kind of stuff, which mm. is why it allegedly may have failed. Um, and all that effort 
all that secrecy for uh, 11 metres of a submarine. For NAFOL! Basically. There were six Soviet sailor bodies inside. Um, what were they doing? Well, they were, sat, they were dead, didn't they? The, uh, the sailors they brought up were irradiated, so they were, buried, they were buried in metal caskets and they were just buried at sea. And they made a videotape of it. In fact, they made a videotape of the entire thing, but that's classified. The old VHS. Yeah. Hard to watch these days. True. But the, the footage does exist, but it's not public information. You didn't find it. Couldn't find it. YouTube. Not on YouTube. <laughs> Last place it would be. Well, that's essentially what happened. So, submarine went missing, got lost. Uh, they couldn't find it. The Americans found it using clever technology. Uh, spent all this money raising it up. The official account is they got about 11 metres of this submarine. Yeah. That's where it stands at the minute. We're going to focus really on the, on the theories about what actually happened to the sub. So, the first theory that's been put forward is that the submarine was sunk by a hydrogen explosion. The lead acid batteries used in submarines of the time vented hydrogen gas while being charged by the main drive shafts. And if it's not properly purged from the atmosphere of the vessel, a significant concentration could be ignited by a stray spark. In submarines, a 4% mixture of hydrogen to atmosphere is considered to be an explosive mixture. And so a complex ventilation system is employed to scrub the hydrogen from the air so that's all it takes, 4% of the air. It's not a lot, is it? Similar to the way that you get oxygen on board a, a submarine, not carried in tanks, which is what I thought, mm. is actually removed. They use seawater and they separate the oxygen from the seawater. It's very clever. Dr. John Craven, who was a United States Navy Special Projects Chief Scientist, uh, commented about this theory. He said, Naive investigators examining the damage to salvaged battery compartments will invariably blame the sinking on a battery explosion until they realise that any fully charged battery suddenly exposed to seawater will explode. Um, it's an inevitable effect of submarine sinkings and almost never a cause. Which makes sense, because obviously if submarines... Have yeah, certain... it's the effect of it sinking, <coughs> which is... Oh yeah, any submarine going down with water inside it, eventually that seawater is going to get in touch with the battery and there's going to be a big bang. So it pretty much happens no matter what happens when a submarine sinks. There is one historical precedent the USS Cochino, which was lost off Norway in 1949 due to a hydrogen explosion in the battery compartment. The majority of the Cochino's crew was recovered, and so the cause of the sinking is known. As the battery compartment of K-129 was not recovered, there is only the acoustic recording of an explosion sound from the SOSUS network to support the theory of a battery explosion. It's possible, I suppose. Um, I'm not sure where on the Golf 2 subs the batteries are actually stored. I would imagine they'd be stored in the engine room back here where the drive shafts are. So they haven't got to run cabling all the way across the submarine. Mm. But They'd probably be in a panel somewhere. Yeah, you would have thought. I mean, they're big. These, these batteries are massive. They're like the size of a car. So Okay, maybe not a panel then, maybe. Yeah. I was thinking like the back of a TV. Have, the, the batteries will have their own room. <clears throat> they're massive. Huge things. But I would imagine they'd be towards the back of the sub. So, possible. The second theory then is that there was an underwater collision. Another theory as to the strange loss of K-129 is that it collided with another military submarine, the USS Swordfish. Swordfish was a skate-class nuclear hunter-killer submarine designed to tail Soviet underwater vessels and conduct intelligence gathering operations by listening in on radio communications between vessels. It is postulated that Swordfish may have been tailing the Soviet vessel too closely and collided with K-129. Evidence to support this theory includes emergency maintenance undertaken at a Yokosuka naval shipyard in Japan, where the Swordfish had a badly damaged periscope repaired just two weeks after the disappearance of K-129. So the submarine may have pulled a crazy Ivan. Sudden turn. 
underwater and they might not have been able to get out of the way in time. And if they'd suddenly crash dived underneath it, their periscope might have been impacted by the sub, which may have damaged the K129. Enough to sink it. Possibly. I mean, if two big ass metal objects hit each other at 20 mile an hour underwater and they're that heavy, it might have ruptured the hull. The US Navy disputes this claim, stating that the swordfish was not operating in the same region as the K129, and that the periscope damage was caused by a rapid surface into sea ice. It should be noted that Russian authorities have repeatedly requested that the Pentagon release official documents showing the fleet movements of the USS Swordfish for the year 1968, but these requests have always been denied. Wow. So it's a little bit telling. Maybe they've got something to hide. Maybe it's they maybe they just don't want the Soviet officials sort of or Russian in this case um, nosing around in documents and figuring out where they're submarines were in 1968 not that it really matters now a bit more evidence to support it a little bit more you know we've got a damaged around. submarine yeah um, anyway the third theory is that there was a weapon malfunction on board k129 another theory one proposed years later following the sinking of K-219, a Yankee-class ballistic submarine that was lost in 1986, was that of accidental discharge or malfunction in one of the missiles stored on board the submarine. In the case of K-219, a faulty tube hatch seal allowed seawater to leak into the launch tube of a liquid-fueled SSN-6 missile, and upon contact with propellant residue, caused a fire which eventually detonated the missile in the launch housing. The missiles were stored inside the pressure hull and though the damage was severe enough to eventually sink the vessel, most of the crew were rescued before this had occurred. Had a similar malfunction taken place within K-129, the explosive damage would have been immediate and catastrophic because the missiles were stored in the sail section of Gulf class submarines and not inside the pressure hull. Upon the discovery of the K-129 wreckage, a three metre diameter hole immediately abaft of the conning tower was noticed, which would support the theory of an internal explosion. Uh, Yankee class was a slightly bigger, slightly better armed submarine. It kind of superseded the Gulf models. One of those going off in there, that's it, and it's game over. You know, middle of the ship. Not the nuclear components, just the missiles, explosives. The liquid fuel um, and the explosive charge, but not nuclear yield. So it's possible. The SSN-5 that this carried, the SSN-6 that the K-219 carried, were a similar class of missile, same, similar size. They're based on the Scud, which is a land-based. Need a lot more propellant to get through the water. Yeah, well it needs an extra stage. So it blasts out of the tube, it's forced out with air pressure to start with. When it breaks the sea surface, uh, it then fires and rotates itself to its target. Very well, clever yeah, design, need, very, need very clever. So that's, that's one possibility, a missile explosion due to a leaky hatch or otherwise. Right. The next theory that's been put forward um, is that the sub was unintentionally flooded. The official account from the Soviet Navy is that the K-129 was accidentally flooded when the submarine slipped below the minimum safe operating depth while the snorkel was in use. Combined with mechanical failures or resulting improper crew response, this could indeed have caused a sinking. This explanation has been widely disregarded, however, given the stringent requirements placed on submarine crews to maintain safe operation of their vessels. So this is what the Russians are saying. Yeah, the, the Soviet Navy say that... I don't believe it already. <laughs> it is pretty unlikely. I mean, any experienced sub-crew, especially a crew interested with nuclear weapons, are going to know... They're not going to leave the tap on, are they? What they've done is they've gone below snorkel depth. And the water's got in the hole. Yeah. Flooded down into the ship. That wouldn't be enough to sink it, provided they found it quickly enough. But if they then didn't carry out procedures correctly, to get rid of the seawater that's on the boat or to stop the extra water coming in or whatnot. There may have been other failures that resulted, like the battery blowing up if water got in contact with that. 
So, possible makes him sound like a bunch of idiots. No, knowing that the snorkel is up, you'd have to be a complete idiot. Or mm. intentionally scuttle in the boat. But it, it doesn't seem particularly likely to me that, unless, I don't know, unless they've been drinking. So there is one more theory, which is the main thrust of it, really. And that is that the submarine went rogue. This theory would seem to propose the worst case scenario, that the K-129 went rogue and attempted an unsanctioned nuclear launch, the most logical target of which would have been Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. K-129's remains were found northwest of Hawaii, and according to this theory, within range of its SSN-5 Serb nuclear missiles that it was expected to have carried. So, Honolulu's out here. Yeah, it's not far. Um, depending on which report you believe, it was either within or a few hundred miles outside of launch range. But again, the, the facts the facts can either fit or not fit, depending on which report you listen to. But the, the general thrust of the argument is that they were about 300 miles away from Pearl Harbor when it sank, and that the, uh, the actual location of the wreck was fudged. The SSN-5 missiles carried a one megaton warhead each, or more than 65 times as powerful as the little boy atomic bomb that destroyed Hiroshima in August of 1945. The theory centres around the following premises. So first and foremost, K-129 was off course by nearly 300 miles. Which does explain why the Soviets didn't find them, mm. to be fair, because they weren't anywhere near their patrol route. The standard complement for the Gulf II class subs was 83, and this one was carrying 98. Um, I suppose the idea is that the uh, the extra 15 people were ex spetsnaz or something, and took control of the boat, mutinied or something. These extra 15 crewmen have never been identified. Some sources say it's 11 extra crewmen. We're not sure which. Could be any. Most of them say 15, because they say 98 on board and 83 is a compliment. Fair enough. The crew manifest for K-129's last mission is missing. It's gone. It's not in the archives in Russia. So it wasn't in the Soviet archives. It completely gone. So well, no... you went to Russia to look for it? I didn't go there, no. Mm. Everyone else that's got more, <laughs> has got better access than we have. Um, Russians, mainly. Well, researchers. Russian researchers. I would have thought so, yeah. An ID photograph of one recovered crewman uh, discovered in the salvage operation cannot be identified. They found a picture. I, know Pro I would assume on his person, so, well, it's after six years underwater. Oh, right? I see, in the body of the guys. Yeah, in, like like in his wallet or... Playing hide and seek, whatever they were doing in the end there. Yeah. Six so, years. Something like that. Uh, radioactive oil was discovered at a site near 24 degrees north, 163 degrees east, which is 339 nautical miles from Honolulu. If the circumstances had been correct, there had been an explosion inside the sub, one of these ballistic missiles had gone off, the radioactive contamination would have infiltrated the oil that would have come up. Okay. And therefore oil obviously floats on the surface, and this radioactive oil is of a particular... The oil is of a particular type that was used in Soviet submarines. Not necessarily just that one. But as a whole. But it was make... Russian manufactured oil, apparently. I've got that. absolutely no idea how they figured that out. I'm guessing it was tested. It was the Honolulu University that discovered it, apparently. So a good bunch of lads over there. Obviously, so know, obviously know what they're doing. Anyone from there that subscribes, <laughs> yeah, they do a good job. Uh, the effective range of the SS-5N uh, nuclear missiles that they carried was 750 to 900 miles, putting Honolulu well within range of the suspected wreck site. The suspected wreck site. Okay. Where the oil was found. Uh, the ship's bell was allegedly recovered, uh, which would disprove claims that the salvage operations did not recover the sail section. The ship's bell was in that room. Permanently attached. So welded in there. The ship's bell, interestingly enough, I looked into this because I didn't, I didn't really know what the ship's bell was for. It's obviously for signalling the change of the watch. Um, instead of using clocks, they use a bell. And they ring it every eight hours for the three watches. Um, but it's one of the best ways of identifying a ship because it's got a name inscribed on it. And every time a, ship's, every time a ship gets renamed, they carve a new name onto it but they leave the old one on it. So it's one of the ways that you can identify 
a sunken ship. So it's quite interesting. You look at the V5 as well. I don't... never mind. Uh, K129 may have been taken by force by Rogue. It says either Spetsnaz or Otsnaz, acting independently of Soviet Navy. Which would fit with the extra people that were on board the sub. Uh, Spetsnaz obviously are Russian Special Forces. Otsnaz was like the previous generation of that. Spelled differently. Yeah, pretty much. These alleged mutineers attempted to launch a nuclear ballistic missile at Pearl Harbor, basically. That's the that's the main argument. So where's Pearl Harbor? Honolulu. Oh, yeah. Well, it's the it's the, it's a focus of American military power, but it's far away enough that a counterattack is unlikely. Isn't it? At K one twenty nine was destroyed by an explosive failsafe system uh, after PAL codes were entered incorrectly into the launch control computer. So at the time, most if not all nuclear launch systems, uh, not just on subs, on land-based systems, aircraft, had, had a system installed called the PAL, or Permissive Action Link. Um, and it either required a code, or a key card, or two keys turned at the same time, it's the usual one. And then an actual launch code, a valid launch code, which normally changed every day. Um, and those would be required and had to be entered correctly first time. Otherwise, the system would either, well, it'd do one of many things. It'd either lock you out, uh, it would detonate explosives in the boat. Have an alarm, it. might have an alarm. Something like that. Like a little bloopy annoying alarm. For the purposes of, know. well, for the purposes of this theory, they, they postulate that the conventional explosives in one of the missiles would have exploded to purposefully destroy the ship. To prevent, because... to prevent an unsanctioned launch. The captain would have to have done that knowingly. So he was just banging on the computer, just, just whatever numbers. So boop, boop, boop. No, well... They've done the key thing. Yeah. And then the boop, 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 yeah. boop, boop, the captain, whatever. Yeah, just, the no, captain's the only one that has access. You normally have, normally the captain and the XO have access to the codes, don't they? In the safes. They yeah. have to do the keys, they have to put a code in at the same time each. So if the ship was taken by mutineers, the captain and the XO would have been captured unless they joined them. But somebody was there pushing the buttons. Yeah, yeah. so the captain must have given them incorrect codes is the idea. Oh, he was an idiot then, weren't he? Well, because he died. It was either that or World War Three, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. All right, no, fair play to him then. Yeah, good choice. So that's the idea behind it. Now, the failsafe system, it's not... At first I thought, why would a ship just explode? Why wouldn't it just render him inactive? Um, but there are precedents. The Challenger shuttle, rocket boosters, obviously when the Challenger disaster happened, mm -hmm. the rockets were, you know, SRBs. the SRBs, solid rocket boosters, they kind of shut off. They had to be aborted. Um, and there is a fail-safe system in there. It was called, it's just a shaped explosive charge which would just detonate and destroy them. But the idea, it's not, what I'm saying is that the idea of an explosive fail-safe is not unwarranted. No. There are certain ocean-going ships that have built-in scuttle devices to scuttle a ship in the event of it being captured or whatever. And it wouldn't be uncommon for something as important as a nuclear submarine to have a scuttling mechanism. Or maybe, I'm sure the Thunderbirds would probably have used those sorts of systems as well. You know that they're not real, don't you? Two large explosions were recorded by the SOSIS, the underwater microphones. Okay. Which is true. Um, so the idea there would be the first large sound they heard is this missile exploding as they try and launch it. <coughs> oh, <get out. coughs> oh Jesus, that stinks. Yeah. It's like, it's like peppermint and fart. <sighs> Jesus, it's smoky as hell and it won't be done. Get a bit of atmosphere in here. So the three meter wide hole was caused potentially by this explosion, mm -hmm. uh, which they found when they allegedly didn't recover the sail section. So how they, how they could have known there was a three meter wide hole in it is another question. Uh, the incident was concealed because of concerns that American pilots had been transferred from Vietnam to Russia for interrogation. So when the Americans drew the submarine back up uh, during Azorian, Project Azorian, mm. uh, they kept all of it secret from the Russians initially because they wanted to use it as a bargaining chip for recovering American pilots. Which kind of makes sense, really. If they were taken from Vietnam to 
Russia, they would have been interrogated for secrets and information and so on. So there is some background story to that, but it's not particularly interesting, to be honest. Um, the International Atomic Energy uh, uh, Agency accident report uh, lists two nuclear warheads recovered uh, from K-129. But the submarine normally carried a complement of three, as you can see in the picture. Mm -hmm. uh, now, those nuclear warheads, it doesn't specifically say what they were. Does it say that? Well, it doesn't, well, look, for example, on the one underneath it there, there's a submarine that was recovered in January of 1970, and it says nuclear torpedoes. Now, if right. nuclear torpedoes were recovered, well, they, would, they would have been the same. They would have said two nuclear torpedoes were recovered. But instead, they said warheads. Now, warhead implies missile. Because a warhead is essentially a component that is placed on top of the missile. So, essentially, they, yeah, that's the thrust of the argument. Normally carried three. If one of them had detonated, there'd be two left. That would also imply that the sail section was recovered. There's only so much you can see on photographs. See? So, that's basically the argument that it went rogue. Uh, they attempted a launch, which basically means they attempted to start a war. They, they would, they, I mean, that would have been World War Three if, if if a nuclear weapon had hit Honolulu. It probably wouldn't have been um, transmitted right away because obviously the entire base would have been devastated. But when the transmission was lost with the base, the Americans would have come to investigate. So they would have seen what happened. So it could have been really bad. It could have been really, really bad. Um, there is a, a further extension to that theory that the Russians were trying to mimic a Chinese submarine in order to start a nuclear war between America and China. Okay. Um, the advantage there being that the, the other two opposing superpowers in the world would wipe each other out and the Soviets could expand. What do they do, like these noodles on board? Or well, they, they think that might be why the submarine was recovered as close to Honolulu as, as they say it was. To be fair, the IAEA mention 40 degrees, 6 minutes north, 179 degrees, 57 minutes um, east, I believe that is. Um, which is way north of Honolulu. So it does change things a bit. It depends on which, you know, which source you believe. Uh, but that is another of the theories. World War Three, basically. Oh, that would be quite bad, wouldn't it? It's quite a disturbing thing to think. All of these have to be true for this theory to hold any water, really. So which do you think? Which do you think is most plausible? Um, I think they, uh, there was an accident on board. Um, what, an explosion, you think? Yeah, and that's what happened. I definitely don't believe what the Russians had to say about it. What, an accidental sinking? Yeah, I don't think that. I think... Um, it just doesn't seem logical, does it? How, how, how long does it take? I mean, I don't know. You know, if you're trained in the Navy and you're in a... Uh, you, even if you're not an officer, if you're a crewman on board a, a submarine that's carrying nuclear weapons, surely they wouldn't just throw new recruits on. Though they said they did. They said 40 of the people were new to the boat. But were they new recruits or were they from other sections of the Navy? Perhaps? Just new to the boat. I think it was an explosion on the boat. What do you think? So let's uh, draw all the facts together and uh, have a bit, of a, a bit of an analysis in a conclusion. The initial cause of the submarine's sinking is hotly debated, but in the end, largely unknowable. What cannot be refuted is that a clandestine salvage operation took place to recover the contents of the vessel, and in this lies a number of questions. First and foremost, what exactly was retrieved from K-129? Are we to believe the official record? that the bow broke apart and only an insignificant portion of the submarine was recovered. If this is true, then what of reports that the ship's bell was presented to the Soviet Union, an item that was permanently housed in the sail section? This applies also to the two nuclear weapons recovered. They occupied launch tubes that were built into the sail section according to some reports. Additionally, where was the submarine actually located? In either case, the submarine was wildly off course, but if it sank less than 350 miles from Honolulu, this certainly supports the notion that the vessel had hostile intentions. And finally, 
what of the extra crewmen on board. Logic dictates that more crew would put a greater strain on resources, something that would shorten any potential patrol mission. So why were they there? And why were they never identified by the Russian authorities? All these questions have remained unanswered. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. Uh, there is a little bit of information back surrounding the background of all that. Let's get that out. Not all of that, is it? No. So first of all, there is mention of what's called Operation Matador. Um, now this is a recently declassified document from the uh, Oval Office, essentially, the presidential meeting. Trump sent it. It's a memorandum of conversation. Um, and in there, the participants are the president, who at the time, I believe, was... FDR! No, Ford. Okay. President Ford, and there's all those other people in there. And it's called the subject, which used to be redacted, but has recently been unredacted. This is the unredacted version of the document. There were black lines all over this when I first found it. But I've managed to find this in the archives. Matador meeting. Now, Operation Matador is allegedly uh, an operation that they undertook to go back a second time to the wreck site using the same boat. And what that conversation basically says is, what do, what do we tell the world? What do we tell the media? We can't say, you know, that it was nothing to do with us. They also believe that the Russians were aware of the operation. Now, there is a bit more evidence to support that, in that the CIA was monitoring US media at the time. And the CIA Operation Sensor uh, uh, News Analysis Service released this, which basically says what happened with the Glomar Explorer, and then it goes in on to uh, explain what the media was reporting at the time, which is these documents. So the New York Times on the 14th of April, 1974, which is shortly uh, after the uh, Glomar Explorer set sail, uh, said that the uh, deep sea vessel recovered part of a Soviet submarine last year, etc., etc., um, and that they were, there were talks about it going back again. Um, later on in the year. Mm. Now, note the date of this and the date of that letter are the same, 14th of April. Another one on the 15th uh, is a report, a tiny report you can see there, very, very small, hidden away. This is just from the newspaper. They just took that bit out and copied it. So you can see how small it is. It was hidden away in the newspaper. Uh, but it says basically they're going to go back, try and recover nuclear warheads, try oh. and recover code books. And then again, later in the year, uh, the LA Times releases another article that says that the CIA has two vessels that have been spotted off of the coast of the Santa Catalina Islands conducting trials. Now that is the uh, Glomar Explorer, which is the big boat that was involved, and yeah. something called the HMB-1, which was a capture vehicle boat, like a barge, that carried the claw. So obviously they had another claw built. So why would they do that if they weren't going to go back? And that's what they say Operation Matador was. So they may have gone back, and they may have recovered more than they said they did. A lot of research then. So, taking all that into account, all that really remains is to look at the legacy. The timing of K-129's sinking was particularly coincidental. Three other military submarines sank in 1968, all under strange circumstances. The American USS Scorpion, the French Minerve, and the INS Dakar of the Israeli Navy. Throughout the 1960s, a time in history many consider to be the closest that the world has ever come to nuclear war, it's understandable that an incident such as the loss of the K-129 would be concealed. Likewise, its controversial recovery. In keeping with many other grand-scale events from this era, such as the assassination of Kennedy in Dallas 1963 and the Roswell incident of 1947, relevant documentation has been heavily redacted or outright classified top secret. It's very unlikely that any new information will be released while participants are still alive. Clearly the most controversial aspect of the case, the submarine's final days at sea before the disaster, are perhaps also the most intriguing to debate. 
Understanding exactly what occurred on board K-129 during this time could help explain many things. What was it that caused her to end up split apart on the Central Pacific Ocean floor, at least 300 miles off course, and potentially within striking range of Pearl Harbor? Why was the submarine carrying substantially more than its normal complement of crewmen? What became of the strangely absent nuclear missile? And finally, fantastical though it may sound, if the submarine really had been commandeered by rogue Spetsnaz operatives, by how narrow a margin had we avoided World War III? Even following the end of the Cold War, we are no closer to these answers, and much like the rusting hulk of K-129, they may lie beyond our reach forever. A bit arty, don't you? Sometimes, sometimes yeah, a little bit arty. It's it's good. Flowery language, got to be in it. End of the series. Uh, World War Three, big, big, you know, big connotations. What do you reckon? Well, we're lucky, aren't we? That everything went all right. I would like to think that Soviet missile subs or any missile submarines carrying nuclear weapons are not commandeered by idiots and sink themselves. But I would also like to believe that. They're not so easy to, you know, lose. Yeah, basically. Because let's face it, they're basically carrying Armageddon, aren't they? We may never know. We always say that, don't we? It's because we'll never know. All bloody mysteries, aren't they? <clears throat> We're in the right game for it. That's that then. That is, in fact, the end of our Cold War series. What do you think happened to the K129? Do you think it was scuttled? Do you think that it was commandeered? Uh, do you think we narrowly avoided World War Three? It's a bit hard to believe, I will admit, but it's potential. Um, I find it easier to believe that than they left a tap on or something. Or left a snorkel up and then dived. Another mystery solved. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, let us know in the comments below. They're down there. Obviously, if you want to follow us and find out more, uh, check us out on Instagram. It's down here. At War Mysteries. Let us know what you think. Whatever you think. Like, follow, subscribe. That's it. We'll be back in the next couple of months with our new series. If you've got any ideas as to what we could look into, uh, again, let us know in the comments below or just DM us. So thank you for watching. If you think we've earned it, click the like button down below. And obviously, if you really want to, hit subscribe and you'll be notified of all future episodes that we release. There'll be some more War Mysteries declassified in the next couple of weeks. And obviously, Series 3 is well on the way. So stick with us. Thank you for watching. Stick around. Thank you very Check much. Check out Series 3. That's it for the... Uh, whew, the Cold War. <laughs> it still isn't funny, you know what I mean? <laughs>